I do not support discrimination against transgender people. I think it's wrong to discriminate against a transgender person in employment and in housing and in public accommodations. What I think is also wrong is pretending that by virtue of asserting a subjective belief in who you are, that should trump material reality. So that is the tension. And what transgender activists have done, and they've done very successfully, since the early to mid 90s is they've pushed this idea that gender identity is whatever I say it is. This is Wrong Speak, the podcast about the things we believe to be true but cannot say. I'm Jonathan Kay, and I'm here with the host of Wrong Speak, Deborah So. In this week's episode of Wrong Speak, we're going to be talking about the surprisingly bitter online battle, and sometimes physical battle, that has emerged in many parts of the West between some feminists and the more militant factions of the transgender rights movement. We'll be talking to Megan Murphy, a Vancouver based feminist who has been at the center of this fight. So much so, in fact, that transgender activists got her thrown off Twitter in late 2018 during an online fight about who gets to call themselves a man and who gets to call themselves a woman. And fair warning to those listeners who are careful about their pronouns. Like many self-described radical feminists, Megan Murphy does not always like using politically correct terms, and she doesn't always call people by their preferred pronouns. If that's something you find offensive, this isn't the Wrong Speak episode for you. But before we get to Megan in Vancouver, we're going to talk about another prominent feminist in this battle, Kathy Brennan, whose voice you just heard at the beginning of this episode. She's the founder of something called the Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft in Baltimore, Maryland, a tax-exempt entity. Deborah, have you encountered Kathy's activism in the past? I have, yeah, but I, I've never heard of her church. You've never heard of the Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft? No, I wish I had, though. Well, it is a real church. And in fact, the reason we're discussing it, the reason the Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft is in the news, is that it actually has received tax-exempt status, just like any other church, Catholics, Protestant, what have you. Uh, And that made headlines because, as you can imagine, a lot of conservatives in the United States weren't happy about something called the Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft achieving the same status as any other charity. So what kind of church is this? I don't know about the witchcraft part, although when I asked Kathy about it, she told me that, yes, they are witches, but it's the modern kind of of witches. I think it's sort of back to nature, sort of Gaian priestess type thing. It's not like with the cauldrons and the salamanders and stuff like that. But what's interesting about this is that to a certain extent, this is like a boring story that you know, for for decades, we've had conservative groups freaking out about arts groups or or churches or what have you uh, that have have frivolous or left-wing activist orientations getting tax-exempt status. And there's this sort of hell in a handbasket response from Christian groups. And we've seen that, and that's this story, right? That's the boring part. We're not going to talk about it. What's interesting about this story is that many of the critics of the Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft are not Jerry Falwell, social conservative Christian types. They're actually people on the hard left, some of the most fashionable, progressive voices out there, who accuse Kathy and others who are part of the church of being TERFs, T-E-R-F. Have you heard the term TERF? I have heard the term. It's Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. And for those listeners who haven't heard the term TERF, it rhymes with NERF, It may not have a lot of currency in mainstream political discourse, but on certain in certain parts of Twitter and Facebook, talking about TERFs versus trans is a huge deal. It's become, I would say, probably one of the biggest uh, ideological battles taking place, at least on the left side of the political spectrum on social media in the last year or two. Basically, if anyone criticizes transgender ideology, you get called a TERF. And I should point out that when we talk about radical feminists, we're not talking about all feminists. And when we talk about some of the trans activists uh, who hate TERFs, we're not talking about all trans activists. This is sort of a subculture within a subculture. But the reason we're talking about on this episode is it's, as I said, it's taken over a lot of space in online communities. But before we go any further, I really want to nail down how radical feminists define their own creed, because I think that's an important part of this conversation. 
Now, I should say that Megan Murphy uh, is more than just your average run-of-the-mill radical feminist. She's arguably one of the most prominent and influential radical feminists here in Canada. She's the founder of a publication called The Feminist Current, which has been targeted by some trans activists as being uh, a propaganda organ for so-called TERFs. And in fact, she is so prominent and articulate in regard to these issues that uh, I went out to Vancouver to interview her. I got a great handle on how deep the roots are in the ideological struggle between trans activists, some of them anyway, and radical feminists in their conception of what gender actually is. Radical feminism essentially gets at the root. So we look at the root of male supremacy, the root of patriarchy, and we view women as part of a class of people who are oppressed under patriarchy and men as part of a class of people who are... Um, positioned as dominant and socialized into dominance under patriarchy. It's, you know, as opposed to um, looking at people as just individuals experiencing uh, personal things, having personal feelings, having personal bad experiences and suffering as individuals, we see women as particularly oppressed in a particular way as a group of people. In a systematic way. Right. Actual feminists instead of neoliberals. Um, we understand gender to be socialized. So gender exists under patriarchy as a means to funnel males and females into these positions of domination and subordination. So, And when I say gender, I'm talking about masculinity and femininity. So we see these ideas as a set of stereotypes, stereotypes that, um, or personality traits, you could even say, that are applied to men and to women, um, and actually from birth and even before birth, males and females are socialized into these roles. So for example, women are assumed and said to be inherently nurturing or inherently passive, inherently more emotional than men, and males are said to be inherently aggressive, violent, um, more rational. And these ideas have been around for a really long time, and these ideas were, you know, behind um, keeping women in the home and out of public life, so out of politics, for example, so, um, and not just out of political positions, but, uh, you know, preventing them from having the vote and from accessing universities and all of those things. So these, these ideas about gender are really central in terms of women's oppression. In, in terms of gender being constructed, you don't dispute that there are biological determinants to a certain extent of things like um, our attitude toward violence or um, our thirst for dominance of others, or do you view that as completely constructed? Um, you know, those ideas are complex because evolution exists. So obviously... And people, like, people's brains are impacted by the society we live in. Like, the way that our brains function, that's impacted by culture and society. So it's, you know, the, the conversation about what is inherent and what's not is sort of more complex than we often discuss it. But no, I don't think that men are born to be violent and women are born, born to be passive nurturers. Now, Deborah, the issue of gender, sexuality... Uh, obviously has been a big part of your research in sexual neuroscience. Do you agree with Megan Murphy in how she defines the word gender? I don't. And I can explain a little bit more as to why later on in the episode. But as for the current conversation, it really doesn't matter if whether you think gender is biological, as I do, or if you think it's socially constructed, as Megan does, because at the core, this is really a discussion about whether gender necessarily is in alignment with your anatomy. So what's surprising is that radical feminists and conservatives, who would probably otherwise have absolutely nothing in common, when it comes to this issue um, around gender identity, both believe that it is something that can't be changed in reference to biological sex. 
Yeah. So in feminism, in, you know, actual feminism, <laughs> radical feminism, we, we want what's best for women as a whole. It doesn't have anything to do. We want people to women to feel good as individuals, you know, like we want women individually to live happy lives and do things that make them feel happy. But feminism doesn't depend on whether an individual woman is making choices that she personally likes. It's about a political analysis of women under patriarchy. It's about liberating women as a whole from male violence um, and from male supremacy. But yeah, so both the, the analysis offered to us around transgenderism from third waivers and from liberals, whatever you want to call them, is that it's a personal choice. It's no one else's business. And in general, this is what the third wave analysis offers, is uh, an individual analysis that says your choice is, you know, people have no right to criticize your choices. People don't even have a right to ask you to criticize your own choices. That constitutes shaming. It's like a real lack of critical critical analysis. It's discouraging people from asking critical questions because somehow that constitutes hatred or, you know, you're mean for asking these kinds of questions around gender identity. You're mean for asking questions about why women are in prostitution and why men are buying sex. You're mean for asking questions about... Um, pornography, why pornography exists, why people watch pornography, why women participate in pornography. Um, it's really just a means to shut down discourse. But like you said, it's a celebration of the individual and the personal choice. Transgenderism is this idea that somehow you were born into the wrong body and that there's such a thing as a gender identity. So in on the inside, you feel like you relate more to femininity than masculinity, for example, even though you're male. And the assumption now is that that makes you actually a woman instead of a man. And that idea is fundamentally at odds with feminism because what we're saying is that those stereotypes are not inherent. I'm not inherently feminine. You know, I wasn't born with a desire to put on makeup or wear high heels or to have a baby. In 1995, Kimberly Nixon who was a man, showed up uh, to do the training course that uh, counselors go through or potential counselors would go through to um, what women, the training that women go through to potentially become counselors at Vancouver Rape Relief. And the women in the training group realized that he was male because he read as male, you know, it wasn't hard to tell, um, and said, you know, sorry, like, this training group is for women only. We only have female counselors. Um, there's no men allowed in the transition house. There's no men who answer the, the line um, when women call in. So uh, he filed a human rights complaint and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Vancouver Rape Relief won the case and they won the case on the basis that they had the right um, to determine their own membership. Um, and they have an, an, the reason that men can't be counselors at Vancouver Rape Relief is because they understand that males are socialized in a particular way under patriarchy and that females have a particular experience growing up in a patriarchal society. Was Kimberly Nixon sincere in the desire to help the Relief Center or was it intended to be a political act? I don't know. Um, Is Kimberly Nixon still active today in the activist community? I don't think that Kimberly Nixon is doing anything to help women today, no. So I don't know how committed he was to helping women who had been raped. I have no idea what his motivation is. And 23 was. years later, people are still talking about the same issue. Right. So what people say now, based on this one case, um, and, you know... Of course, Vancouver Rape Relief should be able to determine their own membership. Of course, in a space for women fleeing male violence, there shouldn't be males because it could be triggering. And because I would argue men don't understand that experience. They don't understand what it's like to be in a situation of domestic violence, um, which isn't to say that women don't, or men don't get assaulted, but they don't understand the daily fear that women experience um, living as women, you know, fear of being raped, feeling of being, fear of being sexually harassed, of being groped, of being beaten or something like that. 
But most people are new to this issue or they consider themselves to be good liberals or to be progressives. And so they want to do the right thing. They want to do the nice thing. Vancouver Rape Relief is hateful. These women are hateful. They're bigots. They want transgender people to be dead. You know, they want to get rid of us. None of none of these things are true, of course. Then a lot of people will be afraid when they start being branded a turf, when they start threatening your employment or your business. Like, it's scary. Okay, so after listening to that, I have to ask, John, on Twitter and social media, you often get called a conservative. What was it like sitting down with radical feminists and having this conversation? Uh, What was strange to me was how much I agreed with in terms of what they were saying. Not necessarily in terms of their definitions of gender, but the fact that as radical feminists, they believe that there is a difference between male and female, and that it's, it's, it's deeply rooted, whether it's in society or whether it's rooted in biology is something we could, we could argue about. But they make distinctions between male and female in kind of what I would call an old-fashioned way. For instance, they refuse to use the term cis, which you hear a lot on Twitter. Okay, uh, so for our listeners, what is cis? So cis is a term that became popular a couple of years ago. Uh, cis basically means you are not trans, that you experience gender uh, in accordance with with your biology. So I'd say probably like well over 99% of people listening to this would be cis. Radical feminists, at least the ones I've interviewed, they refuse to use the term cis because they see it as redundant. Because they wouldn't call themselves cisgender women. Right. They they would call themselves women. And uh, there is this idea that, that women are women, and, and men are men, and yes, it might be rooted in gender as a construct, but, but there's this difference. Uh, but you can see how, to a certain extent, that's a conservative point of view. Uh, they, they arrive at it through this radical feminist uh, ideology, which is also completely anti-capitalist. We won't get into that aspect of radical feminism, but that is part of their platform. Uh, and in fact, this conservatism can be a little awkward for members of the radical feminist community who mostly identify with the left. And I, and I actually put it to Megan, I said, does it bother you that some people would see your position on transgender issues, for instance, as being fundamentally conservative in outlook? I mean, yeah, like there, it sort of feels awkward to be, um, to be perceived as aligned with people who are on the right or the religious right or conservatives. But I mean, the argument that people are making around gender identity, so, you know, trans activists or just in general people who are supporting the idea of transgenderism, what they're, the arguments that they're making are quite old fashioned and regressive. You know, what they're saying is what was said um, in the Victorian era, which was that women are inherently a certain way and men are inherently a certain way and that women therefore aren't fit for public life and politics. As I said before, they're better suited to be in the house. They're too delicate to be involved in or to be in these public spaces with men doing manlike things. So if we're going to say that there's such a thing as inherent gender, that a person can be inherently either feminine or masculine, that's what we're agreeing with, these regressive ideas around gender that reinforces and naturalizes patriarchy. So you could say either way, like, I'm not really that interested anymore in these, like, definitions around left versus right, because I've always considered myself a leftist. I'm a socialist. I was, uh, I'm a longtime supporter of the labor movement. Um, I'm anti-capitalist. And yet there's so many ideas that are popular on the left that I disagree with and that I think are actually really wrong and not progressive at all. People want to accuse me of being right wing. I'm very obviously not right wing. Do you get that? Yeah. I mean, they say that I'm in bed with the religious right, which is such a joke because I've been like an atheist my whole like I hate religion. Like I don't I didn't even know anybody who was religious until I was like 30. Okay. We've heard a lot from the so-called TERFs. This episode is about trans v. TERF, so naturally we're going to have someone from the transgender community to talk about their position on this. Uh, Now, Deborah, you picked somebody. Obviously, there's no shortage of activists uh, online who I think would be more than willing to share their views. Tell me and tell the audience why you picked the person you did to represent the views of the trans community in this ideological schism? I actually put out a call on Twitter 
because I would have liked to approach a number of trans activists directly, but most of them had blocked me without any correspondence previously. So I did put this tweet out and Julie Ray Goldstein, she's an actress and a transgender activist. She had the courage to reach out to me and say, if you'd like an opposing opinion, she, uh, that she was willing to come on the show. So I really appreciated that she was willing to stick her neck out in that way. And so I talk to her now just before we we get into that interview uh we should say that certainly no one activist can represent the entire trans community and and sometimes when we talk about these people who who block you or anybody else on twitter it's that's just part of the self-selecting militancy that exists in all communities uh on on, on social media so I don't think you consider your trans, yourself transphobic, right? I don't. I get called transphobic very often, but I, I don't believe I am. I do think trans people deserve equal rights and dignity and respect. Um, but I think if you challenge trans that orthodoxy in any way, you get labeled as transphobic. And just to situate uh, Julie uh, on the uh, on the scale of uh, of activism, is she somebody who typically would you would find getting to the trenches? And fighting the so-called TERFs on issues of transgender rights? I would say so. I mean, if you look at her Twitter feed, she is quite passionate about this issue. And she and I have butted heads previously about a number of different issues related to transgender rights, um, more specifically around the idea of children and whether children should be allowed to transition. But in terms of our conversation, she was great. She was very respectful. Um, and I actually really enjoyed talking to her. All right. Well, let's hear some of the clips. Uh, in my opinion, turf is actually a it's it, it is an offensive term, but not for the same reason that people who would be called that acronym think so. In my mind, the gender critical ideology, which I think a lot of them prefer that term, uh, is anti-feminist in nature. So I object to that term because it labels them as feminists. So that's my personal opinion. I would say I'm an intersectional feminist, a uh, trans feminist. I don't think in my opinion and uh, in, in the opinion of the majority, not all, but the majority of feminist and uh, liberal organizations out there, feminist ideology is trans inclusive. When you start making it trans exclusive, it falls closer towards the conservative line. One of the things that I love speaking out about is that the term gender identity is a little misleading because by t saying gender identity, yes, uh, a lot of the aspects of gender are social. Well, a lot of the aspects of sex are biological, but gender identity is, itself is more a combination of gender and sex. It's not just gender. I think how we express our gender has to do with culture. So, yes, I do think gender is cultural. But gender identity has this biological aspect that based on how we know ourselves to be. So let's say a born trans woman grew up thinking everybody thought this person was male. Um, that person knows that she's female. And because of that, she takes in the ideas of the culture of what a woman should be and assigns them to herself because that's what her culture is telling her a woman should be, regardless if culture is telling that person to do that directly because she internally identifies with the sex female and culture is telling her this is what people of female sex do. They think to be that, you have to do that. And this has to do a lot with gatekeeping, um, old school gatekeeping of the trans community that in order to uh, – get medical treatment, you had to be super stereotypical and be very, uh, want to be with a man. It was very rare that, that, uh, at least before the nineties or eighties, seventies, that they would allow trans women who expressed interest in other women to medically transition. It was, there was a lot of gatekeeping and that fell under stereotypes. And that's a lot of what the trans community has fought against. And that's something else that it seems like gender critical ideologues are fighting back towards. They're, they want this return to gatekeeping, which imposed a lot more of the stereotypes they claim to be fighting against. That's why um, a lot of my problems with gender critical ideologues is not necessarily their rights. I think they should have 
they should have absolute rights about autonomy um, uh, spaces. My problem is the hypocrisy. And it, it seems like they're fighting against all the things and they don't realize it that they should be for. So, Deborah, a lot of this discussion about trans versus turfs can be a little bit abstract. But just to bring it down to a very specific issue, we're having this conversation in Toronto in 2018, and we have had a, a flare-up of this issue, not not just on Twitter, but, but in real life, uh, here in Ontario recently. Uh, you had a woman who was staying at a provincial facility uh, for women, a, a women's shelter. And this particular woman was a sexual assault survivor. She's a very vulnerable person. And she found herself put in the same room in this facility by someone who she found very threatening. The person she was put in a room with was a woman, uh, a transgender woman, who apparently was quite male-bodied. Um, it was preoperative. Preoperative uh, trans woman, by all accounts, sort of large. She was described as intimidating by this sexual assault survivor, who also said she was traumatized by the presence of this transgender woman in the same room with her. Anyway, this woman complained about this trans woman being placed in the same room, called provincial authorities, and and here's wh- where the story really got sensational, and it's one of the reasons it, it was on the uh, the front pages of newspapers. Uh, apparently. The provincial authorities told this woman when she called, not only were they not going to do anything to fix the situation, but the woman in question, the sexual assault survivor, that she might be in violation of human rights codes herself because she was expressing opinions that were deemed to be transphobic. And a lot of people were were outraged by the story. Um, a specific story like that, I'm, I'm wondering what someone like Julie Ray Goldstein, where would she come down on, on an issue like that? I did actually talk to Julie about this. So instead of summarizing what she said, let's take a listen. You know, it doesn't matter what your gender, your gender identity is. If you go into a bathroom and, sorry to be frank, start masturbating in public, you're going to get arrested because that's lewd activity. It doesn't matter for what your genitals are. It doesn't matter if you're in the right bathroom. If you do something illegal, you're going to get arrested. So there's, it seems like they're trying to police something that doesn't need to be policed because we already police based on behavior. We don't need to be policing people's identity regardless of if they're trans or cis. Because the truth of the matter is, it, when bathroom laws are pushed through, the people who get the most affected by them are butch cisgender lesbians who keep getting mistaken for men. And I, I can't understand how people who believe they're coming from a feminist worldview are okay with legislation that ends up affecting that group the most. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. And that's why I would like, and what I like to focus on is trying to help gender critical ideologues see the forest and not just that tree in front of them. You know, you can't see the forest for the trees is the term. Um, and it, cause it seems like they're not, they're not seeing the eventual end of their fight against trans people. They're fighting against things like body autonomy. They're fighting for policing gender identity and gender expression. And this is, this is what feminists fought so hard against. And you're bringing it back. Why? Because you have a problem with the next minority down the line. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I'd say if you see something, see something, say something, we already police based on behavior it doesn't matter what somebody's gender or gender identity is. If somebody is doing something wrong in a bathroom or a locker room or another facility, say something. It doesn't matter what what their gender or gender identity is. I think the problem is the conversation that we get from gender critical ideologues is immediately not let's find a compromise. It's let's kick the trans woman out. I think most people would be open to finding some sort of a compromise to, hey, Maybe we can move one person from this room to another room 
or from one institution to another. But essentially what we're getting from gender critical ideologues is just remove trans women from the space. And that, to me, gets to the point of exclusion of, well, you're not solving the issue. You're just eliminating somebody from receiving services. I think a lot more people would be open to discussing the issue if we agreed that we want everybody to be safe. We want everybody to have access. And we try to find a solution from there rather than say, let's kick out the trans woman or on the other end of the aisle, let's kick out the person who doesn't like trans people, you know? One final question. So a popular mm-hmm. saying I've heard is punch a turf. What are your thoughts on this? I think this is something that happens on both ends of the aisle. I think the problem that I'm finding is that gender critical ideologues don't, aren't willing to accept that violence happens on both sides of the spectrum. Violence from the lesbian community towards trans women. If you look out there, just the same way you see punch a turf out there, you see people saying, if this trans identified person walks into my bathroom, I'm going to chop their genitals off. I mean, in my mind, there's no justification for either of these two spectrums. I think we can resolve issues without resorting to violence. So I'm the kind of person, and in my ideology, in my uh, mind, I am against violence, regardless of what side of the aisle is coming from, unless the one justification I make is self-defense, physical self-defense. That's the only time it's okay to use violence, but never in sight. The main thing I'd like to know is I I would like us to be a little nicer to each other, uh, maybe tone down the violent rhetoric, uh, maybe try to have more conversations, a uh, little less name calling, I think. Uh, that's that's the main thing I advocate. I think we can we can have these discussions in a very respectful way without resorting to that and showing our views and letting the public or the legislators make the decisions regarding those viewpoints. One of the reasons Megan Murphy uh, has been so active lately uh, in Vancouver is that she sees local politicians uh, succumbing to what she thinks is this false narrative of gender uh, being peddled by militant transgender activists. Um, My sense when I was listening to uh, Megan Murphy and Julie Ray Goldstein and uh, and Kathy Brennan, uh, co-founder of the Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft, is that the debate we we hear isn't really taking place at a scientific level at all. It's almost taking place at a spiritual level. And by this I mean that we now live in an age where I think identity politics has almost a spiritual aspect in many people's lives, and I think that's particularly true of gender. And if you look at the way the Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft defines itself, their, their, their motto is, sisterhood is sacred, which I think accords with the idea that a lot of radical feminists have, and maybe even mainstream feminists too, that there isn't a sort of a quasi-spiritual experience that comes from being a woman, from enduring sexism, from spending your life in a woman's body and uh, uh, enduring the threats and the sexism that come from... Having to live in fear of men. Having to live in fear of men uh, on, on a physical level. And although I'm not a radical feminist, I get why some radical feminists say that, look, this is, this is our coven, this is our group, and you can't just declare yourself a woman after living life as a man for, for 15 or 20 or 25 or 50 years and say, you have to let me into your club. Because they see it on those terms. Whereas, if I can continue this, this spiritual uh, allegory or metaphor, you've got people who are member of the, members of the transgender community and they say, look, it is a quasi-spiritual idea, this idea of, of, of gender identity. It's something that's inside us, but it's not a collective experience. It's not like, you know, there's no, there's no pussy church out there. It's something I feel inside me. And if I decide I'm male or I'm decide I, I'm female, that's it. I'm male, I'm female. And you have to respect that. And the tension between the TERFs and the trans, it's not taking place on a scientific or a policy level. It's almost taking place on the spiritual level of 
what is gender? Is it something that you're part of a club that you experience decade after decade of experiencing sexism or being part of the patriarchy if you're a man, if you believe in these things? Or is it something that it's kind of like, it's almost the, the, the way Protestants or evangelicals conceive of having a personal relationship with God, that you have a personal relationship with gender and no one else can understand it. And once you tell people that is the gender spirit inside me, they have to uh, accommodate you. From speaking with Julie, I was actually surprised to hear someone who considers herself to be a trans activist also saying that gender is a social construct, because usually the sense I get is people in the trans community say that gender is biological, because that's how they argue that they have a female brain and a male body and vice versa. If the brains were not sexed, how could you argue then that you feel different from the body you were given? So, but whereas radical feminists will say you were born male, you grew up as male before transitioning, so you would have been socialized as male. What it comes down to is women's safety versus autonomy and w- whether trans people are allowed to do what they want. So, Deborah, I have to say that I don't find uh, Julie Ray Goldstein that convincing when it comes to, to this particular issue. I, I guess. When it comes down to it, I'm on the side of the radical feminists uh, in the sense if I were running a woman's shelter or a rape crisis center or something like that, and there were a woman at the shelter who, who felt threatened or intimidated because there was a transgender woman who was male-bodied and uh, it, it reawakened sexual trauma that... that this rape survivor had had endured previously, I guess that's the kind of conflict I would probably, I would resolve um, in the interests of of the rape survivor, and I would probably maybe eject the trans woman from the facility. Uh, In the unlikely event that I would ever have to make a decision like that, that's how I would make it. Uh, So I guess I'm on the side of the radical feminist here. At the same time, as as I say that, I feel like uh, I'm sort of in the same ideological league of, as some of these social conservatives who sometimes freak out in completely unwarranted ways about um, you know non-existent epidemics of rape that they think are going to happen in, in high school bathrooms if transgender women are permitted to use the same bathroom, uh, you know, uh, use the, the girls' bathroom. Uh, we hear this all the time, and a lot of it is overblown. I think it should come down to the individual. So if someone is trans and whether it's a bathroom or a locker room or shelter, if they are in the presence of someone who appears to be uncomfortable with them being there, it should be up to them as to what's appropriate. So I'm not transgender, so I feel a little bit uncomfortable saying this because I feel like I can't speak for trans people. But I think what's important is that we're able to talk about this openly because right now, any sort of questioning about this or um, bringing up concerns about the safety of women and girls is immediately labeled as transphobic or hateful. And I don't think that should be the case. Uh, I'm guessing that Uh, outside of the headlines and outside of social media, there probably are people resolving these situations in very humane, practical, real-world ways, and we don't often hear about it, maybe because they're acting like adults and they resolve it. Uh, So maybe it's the the angry exceptions we hear about. But I want to get to a larger issue that I think underlies a lot of this, which is, to a certain extent, the trans versus turf debate is, is really a surrogate for a larger debate about the question of what is gender. And for social conservatives and people who take maybe an evolutionary psychological perspective, uh, gender is deeply rooted in biology. It is, yeah. And then we've, we've also heard from um, radical feminists who, who oddly, as we've discussed, land on the, the same place as conservatives, but, but from a very different premise, which is that uh, gender is entirely socially constructed. A radical feminist would say it's socially constructed based on entrenched patriarchal, institutionally uh, sexist view, views from a very young age, and it's sort of like a cancer that you can't eradicate from yourself, um, but it's entrenched in you, and it's, it's, it's a construct. And then there's this, I guess you could call it this third idea of gender, and um, I think it's become popular, especially among some, but maybe not all transgender people, which is the idea of gender being a sort of soul, uh, 
or a kind of spirit that infuses you from birth and that you can be female bodied but you have this male soul and you can be uh you know male bodied and have a female soul or you have the brain of the opposite sex so that's another common thing that you hear that someone may be born of a particular body but have the brain of the opposite sex okay so i'm glad you said the word brain because you're somebody who as a scientist has has done things like scan people's brains uh radiologically uh what is the science behind this? Does, can science get to the question, which it seems to underlie all of this, what is gender? Is is it a spirit? Is it a social construct? Or is it rooted in biology? So 100% gender is rooted in biology. And I often cite this statistic. Then for 99% of us, our gender is our biological sex. So with regards to that 1% that for whom it doesn't line up, um, in the States, for example, less than 1% of the population identifies as transgender. Um, again, I do think adult trans people should be free to do what they want, and that includes to transition if they feel that that would be best for them. And then you have people with something called a difference of sex development. So this was previously known as intersex. And for these people, they possess anatomy of both male and female. So for them, this is also a very small proportion. This is as many as 1% of the population. And there is some overlap there between people with the difference of sex development and the trans community. So regardless, for the vast majority of us, our biological sex dictates how we feel internally. So for most people who are born male, they will feel masculine. Most people who are born female will feel feminine. Here's one theory. One of the reasons that the trans versus turf ideological battle has played out in such a prominent, perhaps disproportionately prominent way on social media. And the reason we're talking about it is that the radical feminists, to a certain extent, are the only people who are now bold enough to take on some of the excesses in in trans identity politics, uh, because I think the rest of the so- rest of society isn't really doing it. Um, Perhaps, like me, and a lot of people were, were scared of being accused of, of, of transphobia, but Megan Murphy isn't because she sees some of these doctrines as an assault on womanhood. Is it the case that, that mainstream society at large has kind of dropped the ball in examining some of these radicalized ideas of what gender is? is can the science of gender help us maybe push back at some of the, the theories that Uh, that are leading to the schism on social media and elsewhere? I mean, I blame the media a lot because they put forward, on both sides, they put forward one dominant narrative, and I don't think either narrative is 100% correct. So if you look at the left, they say that if you feel a certain way with regards to your gender, that's all that matters, and that gender is completely divorced from your biology, so you really can identify as whatever you want. And then on the right, it's something that is 100% tied to your biology, and so in that case, people who are trans should not be allowed to transition because there's no such thing as identity identifying as the opposite sex. So across the board, if you look at it from a scientific perspective, it has to do with hormone exposure in the womb. And so if you're exposed to higher levels of testosterone, you're more likely to be male typical and to have a male identity, male gender identity when you're born, whether you're biologically male or female. So if you have someone who's gender nonconforming or someone who's gender dysphoric, so this means that they're unhappy with their birth sex, they were likely exposed to different levels of hormones as compared to the peers who share their birth sex. So if you have a boy who's more feminine, he was likely exposed to lower levels of testosterone compared to other boys. So, I mean, ultimately, I think it should be about whatever decisions we make in terms of policy should be based in reality and facts. And I I don't think acknowledging that trans people, I'm again, I'm all for trans people having equal rights, but I don't think acknowledging that on some level, they are different from people who were born of the sex they identify as. I don't think that should be seen as hateful. Are we ever going to get to a point where the gender of somebody can be scientifically determined uh, whether they have dysphoria or not? Or is there always going to be some kind of subjectivity and some kind of self-reporting in terms of how a person feels and what their true gender is? 
Well, the thing with gender is that it actually has a lot to do with sexual attraction and sexual orientation. And transitioning, actually, from a research perspective, is about the partners that you're attracting and whether you're able to have the romantic partners that you want with the body that you have. So this is something that's super controversial. Within sexology, everybody knows that the two are completely related. I think we have a topic for a future episode. For Wrong Speak, I'm Jonathan Kay. Thank you for listening. Thank you.